Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is, wherever you are tuning in, thank you for joining me for Brahma Vihara's Joy. Now today will be a, a talk, a Dharma talk, uh, on the practices of joy primarily. Uh, and this is the final chapter. We're uh, rounding third base and heading home uh, for all of you baseball fans. <laughs> uh, and uh, the first chapter was a chapter on loving kindness, beautiful practice. Uh, the second chapter, chapter on compassion, also a beautiful practice. Third chapter, equanimity, probably my favorite out of the four, although I love all four of these. And now, joy. Joy is uh, the practice that I think, or what I have found in my experience to be uh, the most underestimated of the four practices. It's actually quite a delicate practice. One of the reasons why I think it comes last out of the four uh, immeasurables or the four Brahma Viharas is that it is so uh, such a delicate practice and it requires a certain type of uh, ability to open to things. And we cultivate that ability in the practices of loving kindness. It also requires compassion, particularly self-compassion, uh, because we are, uh, when we move into the practices of joy, we might not be able to uh, comprehend experiencing joy uh, throughout our entire life or what that might look like or feel like. So self-compassion is good here because if we don't have an opening uh, to that phrase, may I enjoy activities of life itself or may I know what to do whatever arises, that might seem very uh, esoteric or very unaccessible. And, and so to have compassion, okay, this is where I am in my own practice. Uh, and to just to keep moving with the practice. If, there, if a lot of resistance is coming up to the practice, just to know that that is par for the course. Uh, we're likely to encounter that type of resistance in these practices. And in fact, we're supposed to. Uh, uh, and then we cultivate that ability to rest in that resistance not trying to force ourselves to fit into a model of joy that we might create in our mind, but rather to, to just rest in the resistance to the practice, rest in to any resistance that might arise to the phrases, the aphorisms that we bring to our heart, and just to allow that resistance to be there if there is a resistance, just to recognize that that's a part of the practice. That requires self-compassion. Then equanimity, also a very important uh, aspect of joy practice, because if we're really attempting to enjoy the activities of life itself or to enjoy things just as they are, uh, that requires that we stop uh, our judging mind or at least put the judging mind in the back seat uh, because it's very, very uh, difficult to enjoy things just as they are if we're caught in judging them as right or wrong, good or bad, high or low, light or dark. Whatever judgments there are, that clouds our experience of joy. So not only is it uh, uh, helpful that uh, perhaps we've walked through these other practices prior to joy, uh, those other practices also resonate. So if you're new to this practice, if you're just joining me the past couple of episodes, or even just today, stick around. You don't have had to do those episodes to get benefit from this. Uh, your natural capacity for loving kindness, compassion, and equanimity will begin to resonate with the practices of joy. And then you can do the practices of joy and then go back, do loving kindness if you wish, you'll start to see how they are related. 
So the way I kind of comprehend the Brahma Vihara is, is kind of like a prism. So we have this, let's say, a, a diamond-shaped prism. And we're shining the light of awareness through that prism. And maybe we're pointing it in this direction, the prism in this direction, and it's refracting this beautiful rainbow light out. That might be the rainbow light of loving kindness. And then we shift the prism when we move into the practices of compassion. We've shifted that prism that radiates a different rainbow. It's still the same awareness, still the same light coming through that prism. But now it's shifted and changed a bit, and that's compassion. We, sh we rotate that prism again when we move into the practices of equanimity. Same awareness, same radiant light coming out, but now it's slightly different shades in the rainbow. And here, this fourth turn of that prism, we've come into the practices of joy. So here, the light is just a little bit different but it's still the light of awareness that's shining through that prism. So much in that same way, these four Brahma Viharas are very closely related, yet distinct enough to warrant uh, a separate practice, distinct enough so that a separate practice is necessary and allows us to really feel the subtle differences between joy between loving kindness, between equanimity and compassion. So I'm just going to jump into the Dharma talk here. I guess I've already started. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to answer this one question that I received uh, that fits into the talk nicely. Uh, how is this first phrase possible? May I enjoy the activities of life itself? How is that possible? I mean, we, we, all of us have aspects of our life, if not presently, where we can remember in the past that would have been impossible to enjoy, right? Painful memories, perhaps, painful experiences. How do we enjoy the activities of life itself? Well, of course, this phrase is really aiming high. And it's designed to do that. It's designed to aim high. It would, you know, it would be weird if it was something like, may we enjoy only the agreeable activities of life. <laughs> Not much of an aspiration there, right? So may I enjoy the activities of life itself. And when we bring that into our heart, we will start to hear the voice which keeps us from experiencing joy. And then we can question that voice. Is that voice really accurate? Is that voice really speaking the truth? So we start to hear that same voice when we move into the mundane activities of life. So we've practiced May I enjoy the activities of life itself. And when we bring that phrase into the heart, really allow it, allow that phrase to really rest in the heart. What does that feel like? What would your life look and feel like if you could enjoy the activities of life itself? Now, Eckhart Tolle, one of my favorite teachers, has a great teaching on enjoyment. And he recommends that uh, we could have, uh, we have a choice of three uh, ways of interpreting the present moment. Through enjoyment, uh, through acceptance, or through enthusiasm. And if you can't be in the present moment with acceptance, uh, enjoyment, or enthusiasm, then you have to or either sit in that present moment until things shift or remove yourself from that situation. Because if there's not acceptance, enjoyment, or enthusiasm, you're poisoning that situation with your own 
uh, negative energy, so to speak. That's how he puts it. And so enjoyment is the practice here, joy. May I enjoy the activities of life itself. May I find joy in each and every activity. Acceptance is going back to compassion. May I accept things just as they are. May I accept the activities of life itself, like that. So that's this opening and, and just accepting. Uh, joy is this kind of warmth, almost like a loving kindness warmth, but not quite, where we just feel our way into the present moment, like that. So we're aiming high with this phrase. And then when we are in our everyday life and we're washing the dishes and our mind is somewhere else, oh right, I can enjoy this. I, this is one of the activities of life itself. We bring ourselves back to the present moment. And so now we can be in enjoyment with washing the dishes. We're in the present moment. We're hearing the water, we're smelling the soap. We're noticing the dirt come off the dish. We put the dish in the rack and so forth. So we're right in the present moment with that. That's, that's where the enjoyment is. When you're embracing and when you're engaging the present moment fully, completely, the task could be washing the dishes or it could be uh, playing an instrument or it could be raking the leaves or sweeping the floor or washing your hair or... Uh, talking with your loved ones or petting your cat, actually the task becomes then quite irrelevant. Because the primary uh, source of enjoyment then is the engagement with the present moment. And so this leads to the second phrase, may I enjoy things just as they are. So when we're stepping out of the present moment, we are no longer in recognition with things just as they are. Now, often we're, we're in a place of comfort, right? Or let's use the example of washing the dishes again. We're washing the dishes and then the mind is, Oh, you know, this is nice, but if I had only cooked this yesterday, or if I only done that, or if only the soap had, was the minty smelling soap, or whatever it is, we're, 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 we're wishing the present moment was different. And this takes, takes the enjoyment out of that moment. It's not possible to enjoy the present moment and be grasping for what we thought might make the present moment better. And you can notice this even when you're sitting down to a meal and you're eating and you say, oh, salt would be nice. Even in just that moment, if you, when you're grasping for the salt, nothing wrong with that. People like salt on their food. But when you're grasping for that salt, you're no longer tasting the food as much anymore. You're no longer feeling your body in the chair. You're no longer uh, in conversation with your friend. You're grasping for what you interpret would make that experience better. Again, nothing wrong with that, but just noticing how it brings you out of the present moment. And that, at that moment, it's impossible to be enjoying things just as they are. And so here again is just another one of those insights. When we practice meditation, we sit on the cushion in the silence of meditation or your chair, whatever you sit on when you're comfortable meditating. Couch, floor, hammock, it doesn't matter. May I enjoy the activities of life itself. And you bring that to your heart and you visualize what your life would look or feel like if you could enjoy things just as they are. This real profound sense of contentment there. And when we can rest in that contentment, well, that's joy. That's the base of joy, that resting in contentment. 
And from that base, loving kindness can emerge. From that base, equanimity can emerge. From that base, compassion also has a, has a, a base to emerge from. May I enjoy things just as they are. Again, these phrases are always shooting high, right? Again, acceptance, enjoyment, enthusiasm. When those are present, these uh, phrases are, are much more accessible. If we're in a place where if we're in prison, for example, or if we're in a place that's, that's uh, a war-torn country, these practices would be very, very difficult. So again, acceptance, enjoyment, enthusiasm, that's really uh, a, a place to be, a, play, a way to experience life through. And if you can't be in, in acceptance, enjoyment, or enthusiasm of the present moment, again, as Eckhart Tolle likes to say, Rest there until the moment passes, recognizing that everything that arises passes. Or get up, change the situation somehow. May I experience the world taking joy in all that I do? Now at first reading, when we first practice these practices, this seems quite self-indulgent, right? We visualize the whole world. If I brush my teeth, the whole world receives that joy. <laughs> if I eat a lunch, the whole world is taking joy in that. Seems really self-indulgent, right? But it's not, actually. Because when we visualize that, we imagine what that might look like. Uh, and it looks good. Wow, right? <laughs> I sit on the beach in Maui and the whole world receives benefit. Uh, what would that look like? What would that feel like? And that feels really good. And we remember what that feels like. When we sit in meditation, we visualize that. feels amazing. Then when we are out in our everyday life and we encounter people, we can take joy in the simple things that they're doing. We can take joy in their successes or their failures. Not joy in their failures and kind of a, yeah, they failed and now I can succeed. But just take joy in the silver lining. Take joy that they might be learning from that. Take joy from uh, the fact that they even attempted what they were doing taking joy in all that they do. Because it feels good when people take joy in even the smallest things that we do. We see that they take joy in that and it, it feels good. It feels like that motion, even though it was very mundane, was somehow meaningful to someone. And we resonate with that. So because we recognize that resonation, we understand what how good that is, we want to give that to others. We want to give that to our loved ones. We want to give that to our friends. We want to give that to strangers. And eventually, uh, with practice, we want to extend that to our perceived enemies as well. And the final phrase, may I know what to do whatever arises. Now this phrase puts us directly in contact with that inner critic voice. And if you caught my first talk on joy, uh, the intro to joy talk I think I gave on Sunday, uh, I talked about finding and dismantling the inner critic. So this phrase is really pointing at that. Because what is the voice that makes us hesitate, right? We're 
moving into a new situation and we look around hesitating. Is this the right thing to do? I don't know. I don't know if I need to do it this way. I don't know if I can do it that way. Right? Maybe we're uh, in community. And here at New Life, we, we all live in community together, although we haven't in a while because of the virus. But hopefully we will again soon. And anyway, in community, there's a buffet. And so we're at the buffet table. Maybe if you're new at the buffet and you don't know how much food to take, what to leave for other people, uh, and there's all this, you know, balancing between should I do this? Should I do that? Could I do that? Where should I sit? Uh, where should I, should I sit outside? Should I sit inside? Should I sit with that table? Should I, should we, oh, those people don't like me. Oh, I don't like the way that guy dresses. <laughs> Whatever it is. May I know what to do whatever arises. And so, again, this puts us directly in contact with the present moment. And it puts us directly in contact with that voice, that, that doubting, hesitating inner critic. Because we offer this phrase in the silence of meditation to our heart, and then we remember in visualization times when we were hesitating, times where we didn't know what to do. And we, we can look at that voice, get a feel for what that voice looks like, or sounds like, or feels like when it arises. And when we look at that voice in that way, that voice becomes an object. It's no longer the subject. It's no longer us or a, or a part of us that we see the world through. We've separated from it because we're looking at it. And so the more we practice that, the more we put that voice aside, the more we objectify the inner critic and put it aside, the less influence it has in our present moment awareness. May I know what to do, whatever arises. Hmm. So Brahma Viharas, joy, loving kindness, compassion, and equanimity. Uh, and as we're wrapping up on the Brahma Viharas, uh, the next uh, episodes that I'm going to do or the next chapter that I'm going to open will be mindfulness, uh, a type of practice that I developed off of uh, two different uh, meditation practices that come from Tibet, a traditional resting practice and a practice of uh, mindfulness of the present moment. And I call this practice Such Sweet Thunder, which is a great opportunity for me uh, to segue into a few announcements here. I do have a new uh, podcast uh, that I entitled Such Sweet Thunder, and that's available on Spotify. So if you go to Spotify, you put in Such Sweet Thunder and my name, podcast comes up so you can uh, take me with you to the beach or in a car. You don't have to watch videos. It's all on audio that way. Uh, and just another format for me to help uh, more people, hopefully. Uh, so that's that. Also, my website, www.suchsweetthunder.org, has all of the Brahma Viharas uh, episodes that I've done on Facebook Live and on Instagram. Also, uh, many guided meditations there. They're all for free. Uh, I don't charge for any of that, uh, so I'm not here trying to sell anything. Uh, but do go to the website if you've missed some of the uh, loving kindness or compassion or equanimity practices. Uh, they're all up there now. Also, July 3rd at 6 p.m. in the Bodhi Tree Cafe in Chiang Mai, I'll be giving a talk outlining the practice of Such Sweet Thunder, the practice that I just mentioned. On July 4th at 2 p.m. in Chiang Mai, I'll be speaking at the Holistic Healing Center. Uh, right there in Neiman uh, Road there in Chiang Mai, uh, giving a talk on loving kindness. Uh, July 17th to the 24th, so happy to announce that I'm hosting and facilitating a loving kindness retreat. This will be a traditional, uh, mostly silent, uh, seven and a half day 
retreat uh, here in North Thailand in Chiang Rai. I know international flights aren't, haven't really started yet, so this is really uh, speaking to uh, my listeners or people who I'm reaching here in Thailand. Hope to see you all uh, at any one of those three events. Uh, the first two talks will be broadcast live over Facebook and Instagram as well, and they will be recorded. So plenty of opportunity to catch me here, there, or anywhere. I will be back here tomorrow uh, doing another episode. I'll be guiding a joy meditation, uh, joy for uh, the stranger. So we'll be extending joy to ourselves and joy to people we don't know, gradually widening our circle of care and compassion, ideally to create a global tribe, if you will, a global family. Once that global tribe, that global family uh, is embraced and, and felt, there's no potential for violence. Hmm, nice. Okay, that's all I wanna stay, say today. I've lost the gong bell ringing, ah, oh, there it is, okay. Stay safe, stay clean, stay healthy, uh, and I will see you all tomorrow for joy for the, for the stranger.